Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a criminal defense and firearms lawyer. And today I have an audio recording that was taken with the uh, Chief Firearms, the uh, Canadian Firearms Center. So it's not with a CFO, but it's one of the, uh, the call takers that are at that center. Now, I haven't listened to all of it, but I've listened to a little bit of it. And I thought I'd go through it and so that you can perhaps see my reactions live because there are some interesting things in it. And I'd like to discuss the law as it relates to what's going on there. But before we get to that, I want to revisit my first video a little bit because the RCMP have come out with a new, uh, an update to their letter essentially. It's been posted to their webpage. So hopefully I'll have that coming up on the screen right about now. So the interesting part here is that they're, uh, they talk about how this letter was sent out and I'll just sort of highlight the relevant bit here. So they say a letter was recently sent out to individuals slash businesses to inform them that their previously registered restricted firearms are now prohibited and that the registration certificates became nullified. This nullification is the result of legislative change to the criminal code and not the result of any decision by the registrar to revoke the registration certificates under the Firearms Act. Accordingly, the letter is not a firearms registration certificate revocation notice. The amnesty order protects owners who held a valid registration certificate for the newly prohibited firearms on April 30th, 2020. So the first thing they do is that they specifically deny that this is a revocation notice. That in some ways is kind of helpful because if they ever try to rely on this letter having been a notice and say your 30 days started at that point, I think this is going to be a very difficult thing for them to rely on. Uh, I don't think that that uh, particular notice is going to be held to be a notice. It comes from the wrong people. It follow. It doesn't follow the necessary format. I'm not going to go through all of that. Uh, but this really says it's not a revocation notice. And so if they later tried to say, well, it actually is a revocation notice and we want to hold people to those deadlines, I think a court would take a very dim view of that. The problem is, is that they're still trying to claim that these certificates have been nullified. And in the absence of some sort of legislation or some law that allows for that nullification, I don't see how they get there. Nullification of a registration certificate isn't actually a thing in the law. Perhaps they wish it was. Maybe it even should be. Maybe it should be that if a gun is newly banned that the registration certificates become nullified. But right now, I don't see that anywhere in the law. So they're trying to invent law that they wish that there should be or that they think ought to be there. Now, there's lots of laws I think ought to be there or ought not to be there. But we don't get to do that. The RCMP has no more power to create law or to eliminate law than you or I do. They're not parliament. They don't have the power to make laws. So this invention of an idea of nullifying these certificates is a problem. Now, I don't think we're going to have a whole lot to gain from fighting this because ultimately we're sort of stuck in the same place either way. But it really bothers me at a deep level where we have the RCMP essentially thinking that they can do whatever they want, notwithstanding the law, the way the law is or isn't. So... I have concerns with what's going on here. I think that the average gun owner and indeed the average Canadian should be concerned by the cavalier attitude that the RCMP has towards the way the law is written and to the procedural fairness and procedural rights of the people affected. But uh, at any rate, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to the audio recording here and we'll listen to it and sort of discuss the law around what they're talking about here. We don't mind that. Okay, so just hold for a few minutes. I'm going to get this done up and emailed right out to you, okay? Just be a minute. So I'm just going to interject here just to note, uh, this was provided to me in already truncated format, and it was cut off so that uh, essentially it's not leaking all of the, uh, the individual's personal details. Uh, I'm not going to be revealing who this individual is. Uh, I haven't listened to the full audio, but if it turns out that later on in the audio there's something that would indicate who they are, I'll blank that out later. But what they're doing is they're moving from one place to another, and so they're asking for an authorization to transport in order to uh, 
to ensure that they're protected in that process. So let's uh, continue listening. Thank you. Um, oh, are you still with me? Um, I was what were you starting to say? Oh, I was just going to say, uh, and this is valid for, for all my firearms. This is going to cover all of your firearms. And the restricted ones will not be on there, okay? And the prohibited one, the newly prohibited one, won't be on there. So I think she misspoke here because, of course, his restricted firearms would have to be on the authorization to transport. I think what she means is just to uh, that second part which is that she's going to leave out the uh, prohibited firearms from the authorization to transport. Uh, of course, you, there's no such thing as an authorization to transport for non-restricted firearms, so I'm pretty sure that it's going to actually include his restricted firearms, otherwise that would be very strange. The one that was restricted. Uh, the reason that won't be on there is the certificate is inactive, so you have, you're able to move those newly prohibited firearms to the new address. So here we have a new, a new bit of language here. She's saying that it's inactive. So we've got nullified, we've got revocation, we've got inactive. This is, I mean, legally, language that you're using matters a lot. We can't just, the fact that we've got all of these different terms is confusing. And I'm saying that it's confusing from the perspective of a firearms lawyer. I mean, what's going on here is, again, it appears that they're sort of making things up as they go. Now, they've just said that he can move these to the new address. So we'll listen a little bit further and then I'll get into some of the law around what allows that and the restrictions to that. That's where you're allowed to move them to. Um, like not to go back and forth to the range, but you can take them to a new residence address. Now, if you prefer, if you'd rather, I can put it on there, but it doesn't have to be on there. There is no requirement for those prohibited farms to have the authorization to transport. Now, if they ever ask you this question, ask that they put it on there. 100%, you should ask that they put it on there because you. we were talking about different rules for transport. And so with that, I'm going to go over, and I anticipated I'd need some of this, so I've got it, I hope, ready to go. I'm going to try to get this done in sort of a continuous take if I can, but if not, we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. But so this is the criminal code section, which I hope is coming up on your screen, that talks about how they can set up an amnesty. So this is the area of law that actually allows them to do that. Uh, this isn't a situation like the nullification where they've just kind of decided that they can create an amnesty out of nothing. This is actually provided for in the criminal code. But the criminal code limits these amnesties and sets out how they work. So let's look into that. So the governor and council may by order declare for any purpose referred to in subsection 2 an amnesty period with respect to basically all of the stuff that they might uh, ban under the firearms and weapons sort of subsections there. So the next part we have to look at is the purposes of the amnesty period. They can declare an amnesty period for and it's required that they declare what purposes it's for, and it's limited to those purposes. We'll see the language here. For the purpose of permitting any person in possession of anything to which the order relates to do anything provided in the order, including without restricting the generality of the foregoing, delivering the thing to a peace officer, a firearms officer, a chief firearms officer, registering it, destroying it, or otherwise disposing of it or permitting alterations to be made to any prohibited firearm, prohibited weapon, prohibited device, or prohibited ammunition to which the order relates, so that it no longer qualifies as a prohibited firearm, a prohibited weapon, a prohibited device, or prohibited ammunition, as the case may be. Now, the reason for the examples they give is really what they were contemplating here, is that if you've got, uh, you want to put an amnesty and you're hoping that gang members are going to start turning in their guns, which of course is not terribly likely, but if they're hoping that's the case, or they might be allowing an amnesty to, uh, you know, permit people who have guns to sort of register those guns and see what's going on and uh, basically trying to get more guns registered. Now, in my experience, the chief firearms officer doesn't usually take exception when people are trying to register guns so long as they're, you know, not prohibited firearms. But usually the uh, what they're seeking is they're happy to have them registered. But I can't guarantee that here. So that's sort of what this was 
contemplating, but they specifically say that uh, they're not restricting the generality of the foregoing by giving those examples. So these are just examples. They're still allowed to do to, there's a fairly broad range for these amnesties. So if they wanted, for instance, they could say, for the next month, you can take your fully automatic firearms to the range for target shooting. That's something they could do with this law. They're not going to, but it's something they could do. Now, if we look at the next section, reliance on amnesty period and proceedings are a nullity. So these are the parts that actually give some teeth to these amnesty periods that actually make them useful. Because if they didn't include these periods or these provisions, you you know, they'd say we declared an amnesty period and it doesn't do anything. So these are the parts that actually say that it does something, that it protects the people who are relying on it. So no person who, during an amnesty period declared by an order made under subsection 1, and for a purpose declared in that order, does anything provided for in that order is by reason only of the fact that the person did that thing, guilty of an offense under this part. And any proceedings taken under this part against any person for anything done by the person in reliance of this section are a nullity. So what this means is that so long as you are doing things for the purpose described in the order, that you are not guilty of an offense, and the proceedings or a nullity actually would allow you to, uh, to seek to have the court throw your charges out. So these are useful provisions. Now, note how they're limited to the purposes described in the order. That's very intentional and it makes good sense and I'll explain why. So let's say you've got the government and they've decided they want to get guns out of the hands of gang members. So they've said, you know, if you have an illegal unregistered handgun and you turn it in, you know, you're under an amnesty period for the next month. They only want to cover it if you're actually turning it into the police and having it destroyed. They don't want to cover it if, for instance, that gang member is going around dealing drugs and has this gun tucked into the back of his waistband. They don't want to have it covered if he's going off to, uh, you know, if somebody's threatening their ex with it. They don't want to have it covered if they're selling these guns to people on the street, you know, if they're illegally engaging in weapons trafficking or importing these firearms illegally. So they're just saying only covered if it's for the purposes there. That makes sense so we'll I but it's also something that is a potential pitfall because if you're outside of those particular restrictions then you're in some trouble so let's go and look at the actual amnesty order itself because that's where we start talking about the uh, the purposes that are covered so the purposes that are covered here uh, are in uh, the subsection here uh, subsection 2. So the purpose of the amnesty period is to permit the person to deactivate the specified firearm so that it is no longer a firearm or so that it's no longer a prohibited device. If you want to give it to a police officer for destruction or disposal. If you want to return it to the owner. So this is a circumstance that's actually hit a number of people. So if you loaned your firearm to somebody else and now you want it back because, you know, you want to uh, ensure that you have it for if there's a, uh, a grandfathering provision or a buyback provision. So this allows it to be returned to you. This also applies, for instance, if you took it to a gunsmith and they're doing some work on it and you want to get it back. Or if, for instance, uh, you had given it to a store to sell on consignment and... Now that store is not going to be able to sell it on consignment because, of course, now it's prohibited. But if you want to get it back, this subsection allows for that. So it allows for it to be delivered back to its owner. Exporting the firearm to a place where, uh, where it can legally be sent. So in some cases, you might be looking to sell this outside of the country. This allows for that. And if you're a business, to return the firearm or the device to its manufacturer. So this allows for businesses who might have had a whole bunch of stock to try to send it back. Of course, the U.S. actually has some rules that limit the re-importation of certain firearms. So a lot of businesses are actually going to be left with a lot of inventory that uh, 
it could actually send a lot of these businesses into bankruptcy or into other financial difficulties. Of course, I'm sure if uh, these businesses start going out of work or going out under and people are left out of work, that we're going to see our current government uh, blaming, you know, the current uh, disease situation for that. So that's, uh, that's its own thing. But that is in theory allows for it to be returned. Now, A through E are sort of the, uh, the limited purposes that the government currently thinks are allowable. You'll note, for instance, there is no transport to the range. There also isn't any specific mention of moving to a new house. But we'll see that there is actually a provision that you could argue allows you to fall under that provision. So we get to F, which says basically that you can transport it for the purpose of doing any of the things described in paragraphs A through E. Now, and it has to be a reasonably direct route. Reasonably direct is always a difficult thing because it's always really hard to tell what's reasonable. If you're driving and the range is five minutes away, reasonably direct is probably just you go straight there. But if you're traveling to a range or a competition, and of course this doesn't allow you to transport to a range or competition, but if, for instance, you'd loaned your firearm to somebody who's three provinces away and now you're trying to get it back and trying to transport it back, reasonably direct is going to include things like, you know, bathroom stops, meal breaks, uh, you know, possibly staying in a hotel. Reasonably direct is going to depend on circumstances, which means it's very difficult for us to elaborate what exactly that means for any particular event. Now, this is where things get a little interesting. So long as during the transportation, in the case of a firearm, it's unloaded and no ammunition is present in the vehicle. And if the firearm or device is in the trunk of the vehicle, or if there's no trunk, that it's not visible from outside the vehicle. And the vehicle is not left unattended. So if you have to travel for, you know, a long distance, this is actually substantially more restrictive than what a normal authorization of transport actually is. So you've got better rights in terms of what you can and can't do if you're relying on a standard authorization of transport than you do if you're relying on the amnesty. You're in better shape for that. Now, note that your standard authorization of transport is a bit of a problem right now because you're actually restricted in terms of the, the licensing aspect. It's put us into a very difficult spot, but arguably you're in better shape because the amnesty may protect you from the possession charge and the authorization of transport may, and this is all very difficult to uh, elaborate on, may protect you if you're uh, transporting it. All right, so paragraph G allows you to store it. If you store it according to the classification on that it had before it became prohibited, specifically the day before it became prohibited. So if it was non-restricted before, you can store it as per a non-restricted. If it was restricted before, you can store it as per a restricted firearm. Now there is no provision for display. So if for instance, you had this being displayed before, uh, that's not allowed under this amnesty. It's gotta be, you're gonna have to store it instead. We can also see transport the specified firearm by vehicle for the purpose of doing the things described in paragraph G uh, by a route that is reasonably direct during transportation. And again, the firearm is unloaded and no ammunition is present in the vehicle. And the firearm is in the trunk of the vehicle or if there's no trunk, the firearm is not visible from outside the vehicle and the vehicle is not left unattended. So you can transport it to another place for storage for the purposes described uh, earlier. So this is what you'd rely on if you're moving. You're saying, I'm transporting it to another place where I'm going to store it. Now, note how hard this is if you're moving, and especially if you're moving a long distance, because A, it's got to go in the trunk of the vehicle if there's a trunk, but B, you can't leave the vehicle unattended for any point, so the firearm has to be basically the last thing to go in this vehicle if you're moving, because if you're moving, there's going to be a whole lot of, you know, it's a pain to go back and forth. 
And the other thing is that there can't be any ammunition present in the vehicle. If you're moving, you're probably trying to take all of your stuff. You know, you're loading it all into a U-Haul. And I don't know of a gun owner who doesn't have ammunition at just about any time. Maybe if you're a collector and you only specifically collect firearms and so you have no need for ammunition. But most of us have ammunition. So this essentially says you need to have two vehicles because you can't have ammunition present in the vehicle. And this is really important because if you step out, like you're relying on this as a defense. And so, so long as you are within the provisions of this, you're protected, you're covered. But if you step outside the lines, you might be completely exposed to liability. Now, of course, the court is going to view it as mitigating if your, you know, your screw up is just a, a minor one. And the only reason why you're not covered by the amnesty is because of a, an error, an oops. But you still don't want to be in a situation at all ever where you can be charged with this stuff. Being charged is incredibly stressful. It's incredibly expensive. And it's really going to ruin your day. So this is a bit of a difficult sort of setup here. Now, with an authorization of transport, normally you'd be able to have ammunition. So it's very difficult to sort of see how this, uh, how this is supposed to protect people. Now, I think you're in a better situation if you have both the authorization of transport and the amnesty to rely on, especially because it's going to be very difficult from my perspective, if you asked me to sit down and sort all this out, I would have trouble doing the sort of laying out how this all fits together and how this all works. I think this would be very hard to untangle. And I will tell you that if a Crown Prosecutor is looking at it and you've got all of your stuff in a U-Haul, you they're going to have a hard time untangling this as well. And so long as you're in the subset of somebody who's trying to do the best that they can here, trying to follow the rules, I don't think that they're going to want to. Now, don't rely on that. Try to stay as much within the law. So if we can sort of view this as a series of concentric circles of what's allowed and what's not, sort of like a bullseye target. You should be absolutely trying to be at the center of this where you are absolutely protected rather than one of those sort of outer circles where you're maybe protected. But the more possible ways that you have of being protected, the better I think you are. So that's why I'd say it's better to have the authorization of transport. The other reason that I'd say this is important is that in my experience, the RCMP are and police officers in general are not necessarily the most up on the gun laws. And so you might have somebody who hasn't kept up on all of this and they may find out that you have a handgun or an AR-15 or some firearm in the vehicle that uh, might have been covered by this prohibition. Handgun, of course, is unlikely to be covered by this new prohibition, although theoretically there might be some large bore handgun or the like. But you might get asked by this officer, where's your authorization of transport? Because they might have heard that that's required and they might not be up on the amnesty. They might not be aware of that. You're going to be in much better shape if you can pull out that paperwork and say, I got it right here. We're covered. So I recommend having the authorization of transport if they're willing to, uh, to let you have it. So that uh, I've probably spoken to enough here on that. We'll uh, go back to the audio here. So the only authorization to transport that you're going to require is for the Narenko. Uh, oh, okay, because I've heard of a number of people. I have some, I've heard, talked to some other folks who in the past several weeks in BC have gotten ATTs for their newly prohibited uh, firearms. Uh, is there any sort of literature or well, anywhere, any, anywhere where this is stated? No, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, you don't need an authorization to transport, but some people are more comfortable with it on there. If and I would definitely, as I said, be more comfortable with it on there for all the reasons noted. Uh, it's really nice if you're being stopped by an officer to be able to show them paperwork to say, I can do the thing I'm doing. That's You're always in a much better situation, especially because this actual, this 
order declaring an amnesty period is actually somewhat hard to find. And there's multiple documents all that interconnect as to what you're allowed to do. You'd actually have to, in order to show that you're able to do what you could do, you'd have to show how these different documents intersect. And I certainly wouldn't want to be in the position of having to give a firearms law lecture to an officer at the roadside. And I can guarantee you an officer at the roadside is not going to want to hear me pontificating about the law. And he's certainly not going to want to hear you pontificating about the law. He's going to start thinking, oh, is this guy a freeman on the land or sovereign citizen type? And I'll probably do another video on these guys later. But uh, it never works out well. It's a it's a sure ticket to having a, a hostile confrontation with a police officer if they think you're one of those guys. You're more comfortable with it on there. We can put it on. Okay. Um, but because other people with normal prohibited firearms that were banned uh, in previous uh, actions, they still get ATC. Yeah, but those too. are different. Those are different, sir, because they... They don't know what we're going to do with this prohibit, these prohibited firearms yet. They don't know if it's going to be a buyback. They don't know if it's going to be grandfathered or like, so right now the certificates are showing as inactive. So I'll try to give you an explanation here that. So I really like that she's mentioning that grandfathered is still on the table. I don't know if politically that's a thing. It looks like the block and the NDP are sort of trying to block that. Uh, I would in particular recommend contacting if you've got an NDP MP in your area because the NDP, in my view, has uh, stepped a little bit outside of their roots here. And I'm just going to go on a brief rant and I am I try not to be too political in anything I comment on, but the NDP has historically been a party of farmers and a party of blue-collar laborers. And disproportionately, gun owners fall into these categories. But the NDP now has really taken a position that is uh, much more anti-firearm and anti-gun. And I think that's actually stepping away from their roots. And part of the reason why they're having some difficulty in reclaiming support with uh, their historical base. So uh, we'll continue here. If the clearest for me to understand is that a lot of these firearms that went prohibited recently were non-restricted firearms, okay? So we don't have that non-restricted firearm information in our database at all. So, so you've heard it there as well. This ban is actually going to be a giant disaster when they're trying to sort this out, especially because a lot of gun owners are just not necessarily going to be aware of what is and isn't banned. There's a list of, I think they've said it's 1,500 uh, entries, but it's actually more than that because a lot of this is in the firearms reference table. A lot of this, it's very difficult to look up. So they're going to be finding guns for years, decades, where people have had this firearm and it's been prohibited and they just didn't realize it. This is going to be a problem for ages down the road. And further, it's going to be a problem for, uh, for sentencing decisions. If we look at the case of the Queen and Nur. And that's the case where the Supreme Court rejected a mandatory minimum for possession of a firearm with ammunition. One of the reasons why they rejected that was because of the possibility of an innocent gun owner who has let their firearms license lapse and suddenly falls into that category. Well, now we're going to be talking about people for generations who might have a prohibited firearm who just don't know it because they've not actually bothered to look at it. These firearms are going to end up passed on from, you know, father to son and from father to daughter. And they're going to, and, you know, all through these are going to end up in places that are just unexpected. So the court going forward, when they're looking at whether or not a mandatory minimum should remain as a mandatory minimum, they're going to have to consider the possibility of somebody who, for instance, their hunting rifle was a mini 30 and that they've been using this Mini 30 for 30 years, and that they never actually realized that somewhere along the lines it got banned. A lot of these people in particular are going to be Aboriginal, because there's a lot of these newly prohibited firearms that are on reserves. And this is just such a badly done provision, it's really going to cause problems down the road. But uh, when they're saying that they don't have knowledge of who these people are, 
you can see that's actually going to be a big issue because they're not going to be able to get in touch with these people and, you know, have any of these sorts of interactions. If Mr. Jones was calling up and asking for an authorization to transport, we're only going to give him information on his restricted firearms because the non-restricted firearms are not in our system. Do you know what I mean? So there's no ATT required for those because we don't have that information. I can understand that, so yeah, but, but with, with uh, for example, with the AR-15, like in the little handout and other things I've read, they said that they are treated the exact same as their previous classification until further information. So those previously did right. require an ATT. So is there, I guess right. what I'm trying they to ask previous. is, is there anywhere where this is so what I'm, what I, is, No, but what I'm trying to... And so here we can see how the RCMP's messaging has actually been really confusing because... The actual amnesty order provides that they can be stored in line with their previous classification, but it doesn't provide that they can be transported in line with their previous classification. So we're actually in a very difficult situation. And, you know, this individual who we hear on the recording, I can't blame them for being confused here because the RCMP has been as clear as mud. It's this is a really unfortunate situation, and I don't think that the uh, the call taker, and this isn't a person, the uh, Canadian Firearms Program call taker here, is somebody I've spoken to on several occasions. Uh, my impression is that she's trying to do the best she can here, but she's stuck with their information, and their information is not great. She's actually trying to provide the explanation as best she can, and, you know, I encourage people not to be abusive to these individuals for a couple of reasons. First, all of these are recorded, so if you start beaking off and if you start treating these people poorly, uh, you may end up finding that recording coming in on a firearm prohibition application later. But they're just people trying to do a job, and they're trying to do it as best they can. They're trying to provide their explanation. So, you know... As much as I'm unhappy with the information that's sort of being filtered out, it's really not the fault of these uh, these people. They're trying to help. Tell you is those non-restricted firearm certificates, which which don't exist, would be inactive as well. Okay, so it's not fair for us to ask you to have an authorization to transport for yours and not ask those people for one for theirs. So the certificates that don't exist are inactive. You can see how much confusion we've got here. And she makes a good point here in that you can't have an authorization to transport without actually providing the serial numbers. And I suspect that there's going to be a lot of people with non-restricted firearms who aren't super keen right now on sort of announcing the fact that they have prohibited firearms. Of course, lawfully, you have to deal with these according to law. You don't want to be sitting there holding a newly prohibited firearm after the uh, the termination of this but it's also going to be very difficult for a lot of people to determine which things the rcmp considers to be prohibited because we've got so much confusion with respect to shotguns with respect to a whole lot of other things so this is a very difficult situation that everyone's been put into because the, the very same firearm now okay so they're the same status do you know what i mean so if we're saying well you need you you can't move your firearm sir without an ATT, but Mr. Jones had 40 non-restricted firearms, but he doesn't need an ATT to move his. Uh, okay, so... Because we don't have that information. Sure. But, like, we can do it, put it manually on there if that makes you more comfortable. Like, that's not a problem for us. Okay, sure. So I, I guess uh, I can understand that line of thinking. So I, I guess, like, my final question for clarification is... is um, okay. Is... is, is um, is there anywhere where this is actually laid out in like actual like legal law like th th this is a thing because on april 30th if i left my house with my ar-15 without authorization okay. i was a criminal so so like yeah i, I guess i understand okay. what you've explained but i guess my, my my question is is there any actual place where, yeah. where where this is actually laid out and said this is indeed the law like where the where the like this is you know the the queen's word and everything where where, where the RCMP and everybody knows that indeed you don't need an ATT for this. I, I, I spent a fair amount of time online re looking about this, trying to, trying to find out, and I yeah. haven't seen anywhere where it actually says you indeed do not need this now. So where that's laid out is in the amnesty order and the criminal code, but I haven't seen sort of a clear, consistent uh, sort of RCMP publication or pamphlet on this. 
I guess if uh, if you want me to try to create one for you, a to create sort of a a guide, I can try to do that. Let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like to see. But um, it would be much nicer if we had a clear guide to this that was put out by the RCMP on official letterhead, because I can tell you that uh, if you're at the roadside and you hand a, an officer this letter that says you know, this lawyer says, I don't need an ATT for this. I'm, I'm okay. The, the officer is going to go, who is this guy? I'm not going to, you know, he's not going to listen to me. He's not going to listen to, unless perhaps you've got an officer who happens to be somebody who's aware of me personally. But in general, they're, they're going to take a lot more, they're going to put a lot more weight on something that's there with official RCMP letterhead. So that would be a really useful thing for them to do. But if there's enough interest, I can try to create a pamphlet for that for, uh, for your use. Can you just give me a second here? I'm looking for uh, something here that I have. Just give me a second because I have something here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Prohibition script. Okay, so we have a script on the prohibition, okay? So... Um, what, what exactly? So is I a, look here. What, what, what's a script? Like it's like a script is what they're they're giving us answers. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, for questions that we would be asked, um, and I'm just going to go look with. There's only a couple of reasons you can move them. Just one second. I'm gonna... So yeah, this is what we already knew. The call center individuals are not, you know, they're not lawyers. Uh, they're not the chief firearms officers. They're you know, call call center workers, the same way that, you know, somebody who calls up to sell you a vacuum is a call center worker. They have scripts that they're to follow in terms of how to deal with this. But if you take them outside of those scripts, they, they have trouble because, of course, they don't know those things. So we can hear that she's having some trouble because she's trying to find the right script to talk about what's being requested here. And this individual's asking for information. He wants some clarification. And she doesn't really have it unless it's, you know, in one of those scripts. There's so much. Because in the beginning, it was just a few questions. But as the questions come in, of course. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, I, I imagine you guys are just as <laughs> It just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. So. Uh, and I have a lot of sympathy for uh, for these call takers. They're in a the difficult spot. They can also be transported one time if on the day that the prohibition of the farm was announced in the possession of the person who is not the lawful owner. So if someone had that firearm and it wasn't theirs, they can bring it back to you. Uh, and let's have a look here. Interestingly, that one-time thing is not anywhere in the law, although it'd be difficult to see how you'd need more than one and how you'd fall within the amnesty if you needed more than one time for that. Okay, it says, I'm moving. Do I need an authorization to transport? No, you do not need an authorization to transport. The amnesty order permits a person to transport the newly prohibited firearm by vehicle for the purposes set out in the amnesty order as long as the route taken is reasonably direct. Thus, transport include, this transport includes transport from one province to another. The firearm must be unloaded with no ammunition present in the vehicle. It must also be in the trunk of the vehicle. If no trunk, then not visible from outside the vehicle. The vehicle must not be left unattended. Um, so it says right there that you do not not, like you don't require the ATT. Now I'm just going to back up a little bit because I, I didn't catch part of that and I'm wondering if she missed something. Order permits a person to transport the newly prohibited firearm by vehicle for the purposes set out in the amnesty order as long as the route taken is reasonably direct. Thus, transport include, this transport includes transport from one province to another. The firearm must be unloaded with no ammunition present in the vehicle. It must also be in the trunk of the vehicle. If no trunk, then not visible from outside the vehicle. The vehicle must not be left unattended. Um, so okay, so that was me missed, missing it. She actually covered the bases there pretty well. So now we see that she didn't have that script ready to go. Ideally, she should have had this script ready to go because 
all of those details were things that should have been pr possibly provided right at the outset because these are fairly restrictive requirements and now the individual listening has been informed of what they can and can't do but it were about six and a half minutes in on a nine minute uh, audio clip so it would have been easy for somebody to have you know hung up the phone on this and not gotten this information this required a lot of uh, pressing and digging by the uh, by the person on the phone and i commend them for that they did good work in terms of getting the information that they needed here oh it says right there that you do not not like you don't require the att and we couldn't understand that either because you know usually because it's super confusing and super difficult so <laughs> Yeah, they, the people on the, you know, whose job it is to tell you what you can and can't do, they can't understand it either. What hope does the ordinary person have here? Come on. Well, you did need an ATT. But if you think about the non-restricted ones, then you would say, well, if, if you had them, then you need an ATT, but they have them and they don't. Because these firearms are all grouped as one now, whether they were restricted before or whether they were non-restricted. They are grouped as one for these amnesty purposes. Um, okay, because, yeah, I've read that, that same... Said, like I said, yeah. I can put it on the ATT, no problem. Um, okay, cool. Like, if you'd be more comfortable. Sure, okay, yeah, because, yeah, because I read that same amnesty order, and it didn't say that, uh, or at least for my interpretation, I'm not, like, a legal scholar guy, but, it, it, like, it didn't say, like, yeah. you're, you're good to, like, for example, what if I was Mr... The only mistake that this person is making right now is that when she's offering to put it on the order, uh, you should give a clear and unequivocal yes to that. And right now we're getting, getting a lot of sure and can you tell me something else? And I think that uh, a yes probably would have been a good answer here because he wants to make sure that he actually has those firearms on his ATT. A uh, guy that had to move three times. Am I, did, I know it said one time, but what if I have to move three times? In the, is the amnesty well. protected? So this is where we're getting more confusion. He's asking, what if I have to move more than once? There's not actually a limit to how many times you move, but uh, what we're looking at is there's a limit or they're claiming a limit, even though it's also not found in the, uh, the legislation here, about how many times to you might have to transport it to return it to the original owner. So this is a bit of muddy messaging, and we can see how it's reflected in terms of how people actually deal with things. <laughs> right, like, I think that that's covered. You know, I don't think it's... it's and she's know, right. It goes with you is what the whole idea is, and it's going to go with you. Okay. Wherever you're going. Like, if you're moving to a new residence or a new province or anything like that, it, the firearm has to go with you. Like, you can't leave it behind with somebody else or... Um, it's got to be in your your inventory. Yeah. And this makes sense. I mean, the situation they definitely don't want is a situation where, you know, you're in Alberta, you're moving to Ontario, and the only lawful thing for you to do is bury the AR-15 in the backyard. That would be a bad, bad scene. So they do want you taking it with you. Your home with the rest of your firearms, right? Yeah, exactly. So if I'm, if I'm maybe getting kicked out of my house yeah, maybe, for, maybe for renovations, were, right? I, yeah, maybe you were storing them at um, some gun club out there. Well, now you have the ability to transfer them to your home. I don't know where this idea that has come up about, you know, you might be storing them at a gun club. I don't know of a, there's not a whole lot of gun clubs that offer storage, and most of them specifically don't want you storing anything there. Uh, a lot of gun clubs also are set up in areas that are kind of far away from cities, because where else do you get a kilometer of land in, you know, a straight stretch that also doesn't have any people living right next to it, so that you've got the, uh, you know, a, a template for a range where you're not endangering anybody. You know, you're not going to find that in downtown Toronto. So, you know, you might have some ranges in cities that are sort of built in small, confined buildings that are, you know, handgun ranges. But even there, they don't want to have to store a whole bunch of guns. They don't want to run the risk of people breaking in and stealing these. They don't want to run the risk of people, you know, something gets stored and it gets damaged and then they're maybe on the hook. So this whole notion of storing guns at the range is just really a thing that doesn't exist for the most part. But we keep seeing that in proposals from uh, 
especially politicians seem to think this is a great idea and I don't know where that keeps coming from. You know what I mean? Because they want these farms with their prospective owners. Uh, already? Sure. I, 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 okay. guess, I guess that is what it is. I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to explain that. So I guess just... Yeah, uh, but I don't mind putting it on here. I can put it on here, no problem. I can't put the non-restricted ones on, but if you just have the one prohibited, I can put it on. Sure, yeah. That would, that would be nice. It shows... I really got to give her credit here because this is her taking the initiative. She's saying, you know, I never really got a clear answer here. Do you want me to put it on? I can totally do that. And here we get him saying, yes, please. So I like the way this video is ending up and I got to give her pops for this. So I like this. That I made every effort to do the right thing. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And some people want it on, some people don't care. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. because there is no you should legal care. requirement for it, but if it makes you more comfortable, we have the ability to put it on there. So if you could just hold for a second, I'll get that done up for you and emailed out, all right? Perfect. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Okay, thanks. And that's the end. So what we can get from this is that we've got very, very confusing law here. Uh, it's difficult even for the people whose job it is to deal with this to know what's going on. I'll tell you that, uh, you know, a lot of lawyers right now, if you go to them, wouldn't be able to give you a clear answer without sitting down and going through the law. I will tell you that my starting point when I listened to this was that I was concerned that they were going to actually be advising something illegal or unlawful because I have heard that happen where somebody calls up the you know, the Canadian firearms program and gets advice that tells them to to do something illegal or, you know, that's not actually permitted. That doesn't seem to be what's happened here, but I actually to go through and look at the legislation fairly carefully in order to get to that point, in order to understand what the, you know, what is and isn't allowed. So I think we're in a situation where it's it's going to be very difficult for people going forward. There's going to be people who may end up getting sort of nearly charged uh, or who end up getting charged and the charges get dropped. But we may actually end up seeing this ending up in court where somebody is, uh, you know, trying their best but still screws up in some fashion. I, this could have been done, you know, if you assume that this gun ban is a good thing, and I don't. But if that's the perspective you're coming at things from, this could have been done so much better. This is very much, it, it's got all the hallmarks of a rush job. And it's got all the hallmarks of a rush job that was done without really talking to people who understand the issues, who, you know, who can stop and sit and think and say, well, what happens if this happens? You know, with common scenarios that people might encounter, and maybe even some uncommon scenarios that people might encounter. You know, what happens if you have an AR-15 and you've had it for years, but you just happen to go down and you want to, you know, clear it, and, you know, you're just trying to be safe because you're about to move to another house, and you discover that there's a cartridge jammed in it and you don't know how to unjam it you know you've tried your best you can't get this cartridge free so you've got a dangerous situation here i don't think that's covered in the current amnesty order about taking this to a gunsmith to get it you know made safe again so you know you can see i'm a little disappointed with what's happening here and i think that we're going to we're going to see problems down the road. We're seeing problems cropping up now, but right now they're just at the stage of things like this conversation where people are trying to do their best to follow, uh, follow the rules. Thank you for watching and I hope this has been informative. I showed an earlier draft of this to a friend of mine and his comment was, we want to see the puppy. So, <laughs> hello, say hi, this is Zora. And uh, anyway, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. It does help uh, make more videos and I hope to see you next time.